Monday, March 22nd, 2021. Uh, we're ready to begin today's meeting, so why don't we begin by establishing our quorum. If I could ask the clerk to please call the roll and to um, read out the call-in instructions and the other housekeeping matters, please. Thank you. Krikorian? Here. Blumenfield? Blumenfield, present. De Leon? Here. Rodriguez? Here. Price? Council Member Price? Four members present and a quorum, Mr. Chair. Very good. Um, if I could ask you to uh, now go ahead and read out our uh, introductory comments, including uh, instructions about uh, public comment. And then once we're done with that, we'll begin with a brief CAO report uh, on item 14 regarding the COVID-19 emergency response. Uh, when that report is concluded, we'll hold it on the desk and proceed into public comment, uh, and then we'll come back to our agenda. So uh, if you could please provide those instructions. Thank you, sir. Members of the public who would like to offer public comment on the items listed on today's agenda should call 1-669-254-5252 and use meeting ID number one six zero six five five. 3266 and then press pound. Press pound again when prompted for participant ID. Once admitted into the meeting, press star nine to request to speak. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you very much. Um, now, I'd like to begin out of order by calling item number 14 and ask the CAO's office to report on our COVID-19 emergency response account. I know some of this discussion will also be included in the FSR, but um, I'd like to at least begin with the top line uh, over the status of uh, the emergency response account, please. Item number 14 is CA reports relative to the COVID-19 emergency response account general city purposes fund status report for the week ending February 19th, 2021 through March 12th, 2021. Good afternoon, Samantha Ju with the Office of the City Administrative Officer. Uh, Good afternoon. Before, the, oh, before the committee, our weekly status reports of the approved expenditures from the COVID-19 Emergency Response Fund for the period February 15 through March 12, 2021. As of March 12, the remaining balance is $2.03 million. I'm available for any questions the committee may have. Thank you. Okay. Uh, do we have any questions on this matter? Okay, um, seeing none, we'll go ahead and hold that matter on the desk for now. And we'll uh, actually, before we go to public comment, just members, so you can be prepared. Um, I wanted to indicate my recommendations for consent approval items when we're done with public comment. So I would recommend on item 13 that the committee concur with the personnel audits and animal welfare committee and approve the CAO's recommendations. On item 15, that the committee approve the city attorney's recommendations. On item 16, that the committee approve the city attorney's recommendations. And on item 17, uh, that the committee approve the CAO's recommendations. And then on item 14, that we note and file the item. So um, those will be my recommendations, unless members have questions or concerns. Uh, but we will do that after we uh, complete public comment. So move. OK, um, so let's go ahead and proceed into public comment with our first speaker, please. Callers wishing to make public comment, please dial star nine. Again, callers wishing to make public comment, please dial star nine. A caller with the last four digits, six nine zero seven, please dial star six to unmute. Please state your name and the item you'd like to speak on. 
Yes, my name is Oscar Huerta Dominguez, and I would like to give a general public comment. All right, you'll have one minute. Go right ahead. All right, thank you very much. Uh, hello, council members and committee chair Paul Kikorian. Um I am a youth organizer with the Invest in Youth Coalition. I am from uh, Council District 1. Uh, I am also 26 years old. I'm a brother to an 11 year old sister and cousins, and a cousin to cousins from the ages 10 to 25. I'm speaking here today to urge you to schedule the Youth Development Motion Council File 210223 that was referred to this committee uh, to be moved to the next uh, Budget and Finance Committee. Uh, the creation of a Youth Development Department is one of the most important things that City Council can do at this moment. We know that the CLA will be getting at least $1 billion from the Federal American Rescue Plan Act. So youth investment and, and cre the creation of a Youth de Development Department must be prioritized. Uh, there's the excuse that we don't have any money cannot be used anymore. Our communities of color will see the impact of COVID for many years to come, and it will take time for us to recover. So we ask you that you act now to create a youth development department that will support us, um, and at the same time, not make this a political issue and not uh, keep the business as usual culture within City Hall. And so we ask you to move forward with this Thank youth you development both. department motion. That is your minute. Thank you. Caller with the last four digits, 1299, please hit star six to unmute. Please state your name in the Hello. item to speak on. Hello everyone, my name is Michelle Benavides and I would like to give general public comment. Great, you have one minute. Thank you. Hello everybody, I am the campaign lead for the Investing Youth Campaign and a lot of our youth are calling in today because we are speaking today to urge you to schedule the Youth Development Motion Council File 210223 that was referred to this committee this month. The creation of a Youth Development Department is one of the most important things that the city could do at this very moment. Youth of color are suffering as a result of the impact of COVID-19 and their lives um, but the city keeps putting off the creation of a youth development department that will help to coordinate the city's investments for youth. We have submitted a letter to the city council file last week with over 64 youth serving organizations in the city of Los Angeles asking for the city to create a youth department to strategize for youth long term. We are asking that the budget and finance committee schedules and holds a hearing for a motion and for the council to approve the establishment of a youth department that will focus on youth, youth development, youth employment, and violence prevention. We are also asking to allocate 1.7 million Thank in you, the 20. That was your minute. Okay. Caller with the last four digits 1990, please hit star six to unmute. Please state your name and the item you'd like to speak on. Uh, my name is Ben Gordon from Council District 1, calling on item 14. All right. Yeah, you have one minute. Go right ahead. Great. Thank you. Uh, I'm calling to uh, provide my support uh, for the committee to set aside at least uh, $100 million of the $1.3 billion in upcoming federal stimulus, stimulus funds to capitalize Los Angeles's first public bank. Uh, we need a public option to invest in public priorities. I really think this should be not really necessarily seen as an either or, you know, it's not a public bank or housing or any of another list of priorities, but rather a tool that allows us to leverage existing resources to do more of what we need, whether it's affordable housing, micro and small business loans or building a 21st century infrastructure. Uh, let's put in motion a public bank now to begin not only meeting these current needs, but also building intergenerational wealth that we can transfer to our kids and grandkids and their kids. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, please. Caller with the caller with the last four digits, 7709. Please hit star six to unmute. Please state your name and the item you'd like to speak on. Hi, my name is Naveen Agrawal. I'm calling in regards to item number 14. All right, you have one minute. Go right ahead. Hi, council members and uh, committee chair Corian. My name again is Naveen. I'm calling to echo Ben Gordon's uh, comments regarding creating a public bank using uh, at least $100 million of the $1.3 billion that the city will be receiving from the federal government. Uh, as I'm sure you all know intimately, 
it is not a common, uh, it is a, probably a once in a lifetime moment that the city will have so much of a surplus in the face of a crisis. Uh, and we also saw that um, the Fed spun up a facility that basically assigned predatory lending rates to cities like Los Angeles, despite our triple our double A credit rating. We need a public option, just like we have public roads. This is about public financial infrastructure that can fund affordable housing, that can guarantee small business loans, that can fund infrastructure projects, uh, at, and we can recapture the money that we send it to private bond investors by by buying those bonds ourselves. This is the really a once in a lifetime opportunity to capitalize that bank, and we already have under AB 857 the law that allows the city of LA to apply to form a public bank. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Caller with the last four digits, 6376. Please dial star six to unmute. Caller with the, oh, perfect. Uh, state Hello. Name. Uh, yes, hi. Uh, please state your name and the item you'd like to speak on. Hi, my name is um, Jackie Vargas, and I would like to give general public comment. Okay, go right ahead. You have one minute. Um, hello, my name is Jackie Vargas, and I am a college student and a youth leader with the Invest in Youth campaign. And I would like to give general public comment. So, dear council members and committee, um, Chair Kokorian, I'm speaking here today to urge you to schedule the youth development motion, Council File 210223, that was referred to this committee. The creation of youth development department is one of the most important things that city council can do at this moment. We have been asking the city council for at least seven years to create a youth department and have met with the most, with most of, of the council members here. There is a huge need right now for the direct investment of youth through the creation of youth development departments, addressing the needs of youth under a department that serves different needs and populations would ensure the proper accountability for funding of youth investment. Having a department that focuses on just youth would ensure that youth are actually being prioritized and cared for. We have been fighting for this youth department for years and years now, and we won't stop until it gets done. However, as a youth myself, it is so sad to see how hard we have to fight and push to get this department. That should never be the case. Why is this why is it so difficult to get this department? Youth are the future. You should want to help us. You should want to do better. What is stopping you? You have an animal department, but can't find the time to create a youth one. Shame Thank on you. you. What are you trying to imply? Thank, Thank you, Cole. You. That's your time. Thank you. Next caller, please. Caller with the last four digits, 6388. Please dial star six to unmute. Please state your name. Hi, my name is Karine Vargas. And the item you'd like to speak on? Caller? I am 10 years old and I will be giving general public comments. Perfect. Go ahead. You have one minute. Thank you. Dear council members and committee chair, I am speaking here today to urge you to schedule the youth development motion council. I am speaking here today. File 210223. That was referred to this committee. We need LA City Council to stop standing on the sidelines and create a youth development department. The city currently invests a minimum of $60 million from the general fund, but it is spread across programs and departments, and no one can tell you if it is making an impact because one department doesn't know what the other department is doing. We are asking that these general fund dollars be coordinated under one department. Once you do that, the city will be able to leverage even more funds from the county, state and federal governments, and from other sources. By not having a youth development department, you are leaving money on the table that the city can't afford to leave behind and that youth de desperately needs the investment. It makes sense to invest in the youth development department now so that the city coordinates all youth development investments. Right now, the city does not have a long-term vision or strategy for youth or even tell us of the program they currently have and Thank fund you, makes Fuller. an act long-term. That's your time. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Caller with the last four digits, 1403. Please dial star six to unmute. <laughs> All items and the general public comments special period. 
Okay, you have two minutes on the agenda items and then separately one minute on general public comment. Yes, thank you. See how nice he is? Oh, he's very nice. Yes. So now we get to number 16, the LA Community College District. Excuse me, the, no, that's the FBI calling me. Don't interrupt me when I'm at meetings. Now, back to number 16. You have Michael Fong, community college board member. He works for Dunn. Then you have Vice President Gabriel Blana. His wife is on the Cultural Heritage Commission. What kind of conflict of interest do we have, city attorney? <laughs> Why are you approving LACCD funds when two of the board members are inside city employees or, or appointments to major funds. I would go back immediately and give this project another look. <laughs> that was dramatic. Thank you. Now we get to unpaid holidays. Yes, on number 13 for unrepresented city goats. <laughs> the following unpaid holidays should be included. Valentine's Day, St. Patrick's Day, Ramadan, Easter, Passover, and of course, everybody's favorite holiday, National Gay Pride Day. <laughs> These should be paid at time and a half for every city employee, even the people doing this meeting. <laughs> yes. Now, as far as the lawsuits, you have number four. Is that what LAPD is doing, Monica Rodriguez, while you've been chairwoman of public safety? Has the LAPD been molesting little boys again? <laughs> yes, apparently we're getting sued for molesting little boys again. No, we don't want a settlement. We want it to go to trial. We want to know everything, don't we, Monica? No, I want to... Two minutes... Uh, yes, so now you have public one minute for public comment. Yes. Yes, the public comment is about talking about us animals. <laughs> we have an animal department. We don't have a child department. And you're wrong, humans. Animals are more important than humans. Animals have been abused more than children, more than Jews, more than anybody. So we want to keep the animal department. No youth department for this city until LAPD stops fucking little boys and having to pay settlements. Look at item number four. And finally, number six, Mr. Sandenberg, that is all the fault of Jessica Fulgate. Look it up. Jessica Fulgate, you caused the Soderberg settlement. Nasty. And clean up CD2 underneath the freeway pass, and fuck everybody who's too fat on the city council, especially fat mommy Nuri. Go on a diet. Stop eating, Nuri. I want to eat. Okay, no. your time has expired. You're speaking outside of the jurisdiction of this committee, so your time has expired. Next speaker, please. Caller with the last four digits, 1403. Please dial star six to unmute. Yes, um, uh, yes. No, your you time has expired. Cut him off. Yeah. Cut him off. Next speaker, please. Caller with the last four digits, uh, 4891. Please dial star six to unmute. Um, and number no, he's done. Apologies. That's actually me. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, speaker. Perfect. Hey, folks, my name is Cassandra. I'd like to give general public comment. Go right ahead. Uh, you have one minute. Perfect. I'm a youth organizer with the Invest Youth Coalition and need this committee to put motion with council file number 210223 on the agenda as soon as possible. Um, as we all know, the city of Los Angeles has no current vision for youth development, and this motion is addressing and redefining youth development here in L.A. Mr. Krikorian, in your district alone, 5% of young folks live in poverty compared to Council District 9, with the highest being 
percent. Um, the city has 15 districts in our, in our home to young folks between the ages of 10 to 25 who need accessible and equitable resources. Mr. Krikorian, as chair, you are a key player in getting this motion to be heard. So speak up and serve the young folks in L.A. And just to add on, um, we're asking that you all make public comment accessible. The phone number you have right now is not included in everyone's phone plan. So I'm sure there are folks who want to give public comment and are simply not able to. Um, that's pretty much it. I yield my time. Thanks. Thank you. And, you know, I should have said before uh, this caller, uh, because I know there are a lot of young people on the line. I apologize for the previous caller who um, it regularly calls into our meetings with degrading, disrespectful, racist, misogynistic, uh, disgusting, uh, foul comments. So I apologize that all of you needed to be uh, exposed to that. Um, it is unfortunately in some respects the um, one of the costs of having uh, open meetings and free expression that some people abuse that privilege. So uh, my apologies to all of you. Um, if I could control it, I would, uh, but I cannot. Um, next speaker, please. Caller with the last four digits, 2616, please dial star six to unmute. Please state your name and the Thank item you. to speak on. Yeah, sure. It's Eric Previn. I'd like to speak on a number of the items in the general public comments. Two minutes for the agenda items and then separately one minute for general public comment. Okay, thank you, kids. It's great to have young people participating. I just think it's fantastic. Um, and, you know, as for the council meeting about the Los Angeles Police Department issues, we've got several closed sessions where it says, you know, related to the Los Angeles Police Department, but you don't you don't go into any detail, and that I think creates a situation where there's a cycle of problems that don't get resolved so quickly. So, you know, like when the puppet was making comments about doing things to children, you know, I know it sounded like it was uh, unsavory or inappropriate, but it was actually been struggling with. Uh, just a couple weeks ago, we settled Jane MBQ for almost $2 million for a poor cadet who was being uh, tortured by her uh, cop leader or, or a, another member of the department. So I just want to emphasize that it is important that we be able to have free expression so that we can call out the stuff that we see is wrong. Um, you know, and uh, for example, in our, in, you know, we have something called Recycle LA. And when we look at our big fiscal policy that Krikorian has on the agenda today under the one of the labels for it. Um, we realize that they're charged with cleaning up the sanitation in our districts and around our neighborhoods, but there becomes jurisdictional issues, like at our metro station in Studio City, corner of Lancashire and, and Ventura and Cuenga, you have what used to be a parking lot is now overrun with people living there. And yeah, that's not, not on the so agenda, much. Mr. Previn. Speak to the agenda or go to your general public comment. We've got a lot of callers and a lot of work to do. Please stick okay, to the no, agenda. I'm, I'll get back on the, yeah, Okay, so the agenda, um, you know, there were some, there was a, there were several lawsuit settlements, um, one of which, in fact, was for the ACE program, which was citing people like that. And frankly, you know, that goes nowhere. Carol Sobel keeps coming out in the Los Angeles Times and saying, I don't know why we keep having to sue them over and over again. And so that's why I do think it makes sense to try to like the puppet said, shine some um, light on these things. Agenda time, um, you can go into general public comment. Okay, thank you. My general public comment um, is going to be along the same theme, which is that, you know, uh, meeting behind closed doors in such a way that things don't get resolved is not in our interest. I did a Public Record Act request, kids, and anyone can do that. Any citizen, you don't have to be a specialist. You can ask an agency for public records about what they're doing. So I asked, how many settlements have we had, you know, that are about retaliation and harassment and discrimination? Because that's what really worries me, because nobody seems to know about it because they keep closing the door to talk about it. So that's why I try to open the door. And, you know, when we do open the door, the good news, there is an upbeat part of that story. Uh, things do get better. Let's remember what happened when people said no during the hashtag Me Too movement. Or, like Greta, about the climate change. People step up 
and the roar is so loud that the doors fly open, sunshine shines into the room, and all the bad stuff goes away. As some big famous justice said, sunshine is a great disinfectant. So Thank you, sir. That was the end of, public, of your public Thank you. Meeting. Next speaker, please. Caller with the last four digits, 4715. Please dial star six to unmute. Get your name and the item you'd like to speak on. My name is William, and I am from Council District 9. I want to speak on general public comment. Uh, go right ahead. You have one minute. Council members and committee chair Krikorian, as a young person living in the city of LA, I need you to take action and schedule the youth development motion council file 210223 that was referred to this committee. This motion included a, the demands and needs that were made by young people all over the city of Los Angeles. And I know folks will say that there is no money to establish a department, but LAPD diversion money could have been used to start a department for youth to ensure that we have the resources we need, especially our black youth who are disproportionately less invested in. There could also be an annual set aside for that same divestment for the same amount of money to make sure that those who advocate for these efforts are included in the conversation to ensure black communities are proportionate, are prioritized equitably. We can't keep investing in law enforcement that criminalizes our youth. We need strategies and we need. Thank you, speaker. All right, thank you. Next speaker, please. Caller with the last four digits, 4208. Please dial star six to unmute. Please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Hi, uh, it's Rob Kwan. I'd like to speak on items four, five, seven, 12, and general public comment. Okay, Mr. Kwan, two minutes on the agenda items and then separately one minute on general public comment. Thank you. Um, really quickly, for the FSR, I just think it's worth highlighting that LAPD is over $21 million over their budget, um, thanks to the feds. This isn't as big of a headache, but um, imagine what kind of world of pain we'd be in without that help. Um, for item seven, this involves Jesse Leone, uh, formerly of CD14. Uh, it's already on the council agenda this week, so it looks like y'all are really eager to settle this thing maybe because of his allegations of pay-to-play corruption involving cannabis, something that the public FBI reporting has not uh, shed anything on, but maybe there's something there. Um, item five, um, an LAPD shooting. Um, worth noting, the number of items here, LAP is just racking things up. Item four in particular on that note, uh, a lot of people calling in today about youth development, and I, I think looking at this LAPD character-building camp we have a law school torts professor's dream. Basically, LAPD was running a fight club for kids. They left um, all of these kids in the care of a volunteer, had no oversight from the city. Um, this volunteer was threatening to punish children for speaking in Spanish, said their parents should be deported, instructed kids to punch other kids as punishment for speaking Spanish or doing anything else wrong, uh, told them they'd be punched if they didn't hit their peers, a kid who was punched in the leg cried, and she told them they'd be punched in the face next time. Uh, one thing asked about here is, are you going to do anything to ensure uh, discipline for Officer Bonita Williams? Uh, I want to make sure the kids can get in here, but I think the, the contrast between the LAPD character building camp shows that you got to come up with something better so we're not just sending these kids into the untrustworthy hands of LAPD. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Kwan. Uh, next speaker, please. That concludes our um, public speaker or our um, Collins. Um, just as a reminder, if you just as a last call, if you would like to speak, uh, please select star nine. If you have not already spoken, please select star nine to speak. It looks like we don't have any other callers that haven't already spoken. 
Okay, uh, very good. Well, thank you to all the callers uh, who called in. I appreciate your involvement with the Budget and Finance Committee um, and your advocacy uh, for some very important issues. So thank you. Um, members, that will close public comment on all of our agenda items. And that will also close general public comment. And that will take us next to our consent items, which um, I previously had indicated my recommendations. Does anybody have any questions or concerns uh, about any of those recommendations as I indicated earlier? Seeing none, um, let's go ahead and uh, call the roll on the consent item recommendations that I indicated earlier. That would be on uh, items Items number 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. Krikorian. Aye. Blumenfield. Blumenfield, aye. De Leon. Aye. Rodriguez. Aye. Price. Aye. Five ayes. These items are approved as stated by the chair. Very good. Thank you very much. That brings us to item number 12. So if we can call number that 12 item. is the city administrative officer report relative to the third or the mid-year financial status report for fiscal year 2020-21. And members, if I'm not mistaken, uh, I think this may be the first full FSR uh, that we have had since the uh, committee was uh, reconstituted. And so for our newer members, uh, the, what we typically do with the FSR is we hear first the, the report, the overall report from the CAO, um, and we can go to questions to the CAO. And then uh, what I'd ask you to do is call special any departments that you would like to ask uh, to, to respond to questions specifically relating to those departments. So that way we can dismiss the many departmental representatives who are on this call if there are no questions for those departments. Uh, so with that, let's go ahead and uh, go to Mr. Llewellyn. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. I will give you a brief overview of our mid-year FSR, and then I will turn it over to Wilson Pooner in our office, who will walk you through the details. Um, for once, we can start with some good news. Um, after a really, really tough year, things are actually looking up uh, in our communities and in our city's finances. With the implementation of a wider vaccination program, and the passage of the American Rescue Plan, or ARP, we can begin to hope that the worst of the pandemic and its impacts are going to be behind us. The American Rescue Plan is expected to provide the city directly with just over 1.3 billion, that's with a B, dollars, from the plan's funding for state and local government. The city will also be eligible to sometimes compete, sometimes direct allocation for other specific funding pots in the ARP, including important things such as funding for vaccinations and homelessness and housing. Working with the city's Washington DC office, we're seeking guidance from the Biden administration on just how flexible our state and local government funding pot will be. We hope that these federal relief funds will enable us to balance this year's budget, restore our reserves, and return the city to solid financial footing. Still, if the guidance doesn't give us the flexibility we want, we also are confident that the city's budget balancing plan, as it stands, will address our budget gap. Yes, to do so, we would have to borrow and use all but the emergency portion of our reserves, these actions are far from ideal. Still, it's worth stopping for a minute and thanking you and congratulating you because at this point, we didn't even know if we would have a budget balancing plan at all. Um, you've 
led extraordinary ways this year. Let me briefly discuss the American Rescue Plan, the better option, and then the budget balancing sort of worse option. So it's the American Rescue Plan, as you know, among many literally life-saving provisions, it sends money directly to local government. We believe the city share will be about 1.35 billion, and then it will arrive, arrive in two equal payments, one towards the end of this year, fiscal year, and one 12 months later. Before we can spend them, we need final guidance, actually initial guidance from the Biden administration on exactly how the funds can be spent, but we are hoping they will be allowed to be used for revenue replacement with very limited strings. Using our own methodology, we've identified conservatively city revenue losses in excess of the entire amount of funds we've received. Assuming that the administration in Washington provides clear guidance that revenue replacement funds are flexible. Using the funds as revenue replacement gives you, the policymakers, quite frankly, the most discretion on how to spend them. We therefore recommend you designate as much as revenue replacement as possible. If we can use these funds as revenue replacement, we have sort of three initial pots. First, solve this year's budget balancing problem. No borrowing and no use of the reserve funds. That will take 427 million of the first check. Second, about 196 million was taken from the reserve fund to balance last year. We recommend you put that back in the reserve fund. That leaves of this first check only $54 million only, which is a positive thing only. And we do recommend you save that for programming during the budget process. With these use of the money, we'll be back on a solid financial footing. We recommend you sort of hold the money as long as possible, especially till you see how much we get in the designated pots from the ARP, the other pots, so that you don't spend the money twice in the same area. And this will comply with our financial policies. It will leave us with the healthiest reserves any of us have seen, slightly over 11%, which is amazing. Um, but as your committee knows more than most, that is a little less than it seems. We expect next year to be another rough year revenue wise. And we are very concerned that the tail end recession of the COVID pandemic will be particularly tough on our low income residents. You will need money over the next few years to totally solve what sort of COVID is leaving behind. Um, just while we certainly hope that the American Rescue Plan is our budget balancing plan for this year, your committee has developed a plan that will balance the budget if we have to. We're in fact reporting a slightly better plan for 2021 than our last report. Our gap has gone down about $70 million. Um, and we believe we can in fact balance this year if we have to. And in fact, it will require a slightly less borrowing, only 133 million instead of 150 million. Um, we think that will be still require using the entire budget stabilization fund and the entire contingency reserve. Obviously not preferred. Um, at this time, we have heard from many people wondering, in light of the ARP, if we should start spending again. We quite frankly don't recommend that, certainly not yet. Even replacing things that were formerly in our capital plan that you may want to add back in for MICLA and other capital spending. As we mentioned, at this time, we don't know the rules on the revenue replacement money. Until we know those rules and know how flexible or non-flexible they are, we recommend you not program them. Um, if, in fact, we get the flexibility we want and hope for, it seems to me the right time to budget all of those funds would be through the budget process when you have an idea about next year's gap and an idea about the whole list of needs. Um, the one thing you may have noticed in one of our reports, um, reauthorizing fleet uh, for fire, 
That is not new money. That's old money. Um, it's a procedural money, so we are not adding money anywhere at this time. Um, and one final note before we open it up, or we can go to Wilson, Mr. Chair. Um, we have been under a strict hiring moratorium. Some people might just call it a freeze, but we like moratorium better. Um, it has been very difficult for the city, but quite frankly, it has helped us save money. We do feel now with the ARP, with the slightly reduced deficit, that we need to kind of open the spigot just a bit. Um, there are critical positions around the city that need some kind of process to be looked at. So we are recommending going back to managed hiring. We do not recommend lifting hiring restrictions yet in their totality. Again, until we get guidance from Washington on the Biden plan, we don't think it's wise. But we do think we need to start looking at some vacancies of a critical nature. So we are recommending moving back to managed hiring, and we be will believe we will have guidance by the time your committee and the council considers the budget for next year, where at which point you may make a different decision about hiring going forward. So with that, that is just my opening comments. Wilson's here to take you through the details. We're happy to answer questions now or at the end, sir, whatever you want, Mr. Chair. Um, I think what we'll do is uh, we'll hear from Mr. Poon first and then go to member questions. I do just before before he begins, though, on the details, I do just want to uh, make one comment on, on your overview, Mr. Llewellyn, and first thank you and the office of the CAO uh, for the work that you've done in this most trying of budget years ever. Um, and uh, there was no guarantee at all that um, we would get any federal support whatsoever um, until it actually happened. And so throughout this, we've had to work on the assumption that we would not have any federal help. And um, your office working with this committee uh, has had to make some incredibly difficult, painful recommendations uh, that thankfully, um, some of the pain of which has now been relieved. And I think um, for all of us who've worked very hard uh, together with the mayor to uh, ensure that our federal government remembered local government in this package, um, it's a it's certainly a great relief uh, to know that that money is there. Um, but I just want to put into, into a little bit of context uh, for folks who are listening who may not have appreciated the magnitude of what you just said. Um, in, uh, in the last fiscal year, 2019-2020, this city came up $200 million short of our revenue projections, um, 196 to be exact. This fiscal year, we are $600 million more or less short of revenue projections. So over the course of two years, we've had an $800 million shortfall in revenues. Um, so given the fact that only half of this federal money will be received this fiscal year, uh, the entire package of federal money, even if we get the most liberal uh, interpretation, which I think we should, of what revenue replacement uh, means under the federal law, the entirety of it would be used just to make up what we've already lost this year and the previous year. In fact, that would still leave us in the hole. So I, I just want to reiterate this because while next year we'll have another tranche of money, another 670 or so million dollars that will be coming in next year, um, this year, that money is pretty much already spoken for just to get us not even back to even. Um, so I, I think we have to keep repeating this uh, as many times as we can so that people don't think that we've just been given a huge gift from the federal government that we can, you know, um, just spend. We can't. This is first aid for the immediate bleeding 
that the city is experiencing uh, in its budget right now. And next year, there's a lot of uh, question marks still to come, whether or not the variants of this virus cause future shutdowns and other uh, problems with our revenue streams next year. No one knows this yet. Um, no one knows how long it will take for our economy to get back up and running, uh, even if there isn't uh, a continuing uh, emergency situation with COVID. Um, no one knows how much more uh, we'll need to invest in uh, assisting uh, the people who are suffering the most in this economy right now. So these are all a lot of gray areas that we still have to work out uh, before we start thinking about dramatic new uh, changes in, in programming based on this federal money. Um, so I, I just wanted not to put too fine a point on it, but just to reemphasize uh, what you said, Mr. Llewellyn, because I think some people may not appreciate the magnitude of these numbers, um, but $800 million in revenue shortfalls is, um, I think, unprecedented in the history of the city. And um, while I'm relieved that we have this help, uh, this help is, is only really going to stop the bleeding. Uh, so with that, let's go next to Mr. Poon, and then we'll come back and have further discussion about the complete report. Thank you. Um... Wilson Poon with the CAO's office. Um, Rich really covered the meat of the report, so I'll really try to keep my presentation short and I'll, I'll kind of uh, start on page 11 with our revenues. As of the uh, end of February, we are $365 million below plan. And so therefore we are continuing to project a potential year end revenue shortfall of $600 million. On the expenditure side, um, we have identified $109 million in expenditures above plan and an additional $8 million in general fund appropriations required to supplement special fund revenue shortfalls for a total year and amount of $117 million. The recommendations in this FSR will reduce that amount by $12.5 million. And we have also identified future actions that would further reduce this amount by $91 million, leaving a balance of $13.7 million at the year end. At this time, we are recommending about $75 million in budgetary adjustments. This will provide sufficient funds for departments to sustain operations as well as meet payroll obligations until the year in FSR. Expenditure projections were based on data through the end of December. And as we expected, most of the expenditures above plan were due to the elimination of furloughs and the unbudgeted retirement payouts for SIP participants. The budget included $139 million in savings from 26 civilian furlough days, and a portion of this was offset with the deferral of the COLAs and the addition of the unpaid days. Um, next, we have our reserves. Currently, our reserves are at $528 million, or $7.9 million, 7.9% of general fund revenues. Um, as Rich mentioned earlier, as we await guidance on the use of the ARP funds. And in the event that we don't get the flexibility in the use of those federal funds, we are recommending that the council authorize the controller to use the full amount in the contingency reserve for cash flow purposes. Um, we also have a recommendation in this FSR for the budget stabilization fund for the council to approve the average annual ongoing growth threshold for the 21-22 budget of 4.1%. Um, last, there's a, towards the back of the report, we've included a discussion on the deferral of the fourth quarter contractual payments. We asked departments to provide their estimated fourth quarter payments and how much they thought could be deferred. Departments reported $288 million in fourth quarter payments with about $48 million they felt could be deferred. Uh, about $45 million that could be deferred is related to um, human resources benefits service provide service provider contracts. This is for the civilian healthcare, dental, and the life and disability insurance premiums where the service providers have agreed to allow the city to defer two months of payments. Uh, we are not recommending that the city defer these payments at this time. Um, and that kind of concludes my presentation. Um, I also have one amendment to the FSR. 
uh, provided copies to the clerk and can also read the amendment into the record. Um, it's to revise recommendation number 29. Yes, please go ahead and read it. Yeah, this is to revise recommendation 29 as it relates to the police department um, to de decrease appropriations totaling $1.1 million within the Supplemental Law Enforcement Services Fund number 667, Department 46, account number 46T170, police and reduce corresponding appropriations within the police department fund number 100 department 70 account number 003090 field equipment expense previously we have all we had identified the transportation equipment account and um, we're removing that uh, account and changing it to the field equipment expense account so that concludes my presentation and i'm available to answer any questions Great. Uh, thank you very much uh, to both you, Mr. Poon and Mr. Llewellyn. Um, kind of hard to, to call this a really great report, but it is sure great compared to everything that we've been hearing uh, <laughs> over the last year. So uh, thank you both. I, I just have one, Pardon me, it's kind of a technical question, but it's a, a significant one. Uh, and that is, um, I wonder if you can clarify yet, and maybe this is something that we still need clarification from the federal government on, but can you clarify the interface between uh, the ARP revenue replacement and FEMA reimbursement? So for example, if we have drawn from the reserve to expend uh, reimbursable expenses and then those revenues are replaced in the reserve under the ARP. Um, can that in any way impact the reimbursability of reimbursable expenses or, so or vice versa? If we're seeking reimbursement for it, might that preclude us from getting rid? It, it seems to me that those are distinct issues and they should be distinct. And you know, our expenses would have been reimbursable or not, regardless of whether we had a loss of revenues. So to me, there shouldn't be a connection, but uh, you know, as with everything, when you're dealing with a complicated federal uh, program, uh, I just want to make sure that we are clear as we can be that there's no impact one against the other. So um, Mr. Chair, we are concerned about the same thing um, where somehow we will be some of the money will be counted as federal and can't be counted against federal somehow. Um, as you know, with the uh, CRF funds last year, they did say we could front fund it for front fund FEMA and not reduce our FEMA application. Whereas with other federal monies, they said you couldn't like CDBG funds. So we are in fact trying to get clarification on that. Um, if it turns out somehow the two lanes are merged, we may have slightly different recommendations to make sure we don't reduce our FEMA uh, reimbursement. But we are hopeful like you that there will be no linkage and that the, this money can come in and be spent for whatever the city and other local governments around the country deem important. Because that's what it was designed for, to keep us as an economic right. engine, to not lay off people, et cetera, regardless of COVID. If cities lay off staff, obviously it's hurting the economy. Okay, thank you. Mr. Blumenfield. Great, thank you. No, in fact, I, I was going down that same road about the FEMA money. I wanna make sure that we, you know, I, I think I, I'm a broken record on the FEMA stuff every every time you're before the budget about that we maximize our, our FEMA uh, reimbursements. And here's here's a just a, a road to walk down to make sure we don't accidentally do something to, to minimize them. And at, at the same token, um, when it comes to FEMA, you know, one of the frustrations, we all want to see the, the, the money for, uh, you know, Project Room Key and other things go as fast as we can. And we're, we're, I'm certainly frustrated not seeing it move fast enough when it's, it's reimbursable. Can some of this money be used to get us? And, and last time I asked about the FEMA reimbursement, it wasn't a resource question. It was sort of a staffing question and, and um, there were a number of other factors of why we're not moving faster. Can some of this money be used to fix that problem so that we can get the resources that we need so that we can 
basically draw down FEMA money faster? And what do we need to do on that? So, Council Member, I appreciate uh, the question. Um, we have um, we have increased our FEMA billing this week. And we have actually started talking to contract providers. The mayor's office has provided us additional staff about bringing on contractors to help us do that even faster. Um, we do believe that in general, you can use even FEMA money for FEMA overhead. So we believe we will be able to fund that. Um, but if we need to actually move some of this money into a kind of billing pot, we will request that authorization. I do think it's important for your listeners, our residents to hear, there is no hotel we have not rented. There is no space we have not gone down because of absence of resources. Your council and mayor have made it clear we have to do what we have to do and we have done it. I think there was some confusion about whether there are opportunities we're not taking advantage of and there are not such opportunities. Okay, I mean, obviously, Having a little extra, we, we want people, you know, knocking on all the doors to create more opportunities so that we don't, so that we, we're not limited to the ones that we've, that we've gone down. Um, just first of all, overall, I, I appreciate your frame on, on the, the funding and, and the chair's frame. And, you know, I, I think I agree that the most important thing right now is to get us back on financial footing. And, and what I, I like to think of as undo the things that we did out of financial desperation that are not good for this city. You know, prime example is borrowing for operating expenses. That's just such a, a bad idea, but we did it because we were financially desperate and, uh, and drawing down our reserves to dangerous levels. Same concept. We did it because we were financially desperate. And the first thing we need to do with the federal money is undo those things because those things cost us money and ability to do our city work for years to come. And we want to make sure that we're in a strong position so that we can do all of the good things that we do as a city and help all the people that we do. Uh, so it's not just a question of do we spend the money here or put it in reserve. By getting our reserves and our financial house in order, we're able to actually spend more on our services, which is what the bottom line is what we're all here about. Um, so, you know, in terms of putting off some of these decisions uh, until we actually have the budget process, I, I, I think that makes sense. Um, and uh, one of the other things in terms of, you know, undoing the financially desperate things, the, and I think you might have mentioned it, Mr. Poon, but I want to confirm this, you know, we deferred a lot of contract payments. And that's, that's also just a bad business practice as a city and it's not good for us in the long run, even if we could save a little bit of money by, by screwing over our contractors for a few months, that's a, that's a desperation move. So are we going to um, defer those, those, continue to defer those fourth quarter payments to city contractors or are we gonna be able to use this money to, to fill that gap and, and, and sort of restore the city name as, as a, someone who pays their bills? Council member, we, we recommend against kicking those bills into next year. Next year is going to be tough enough as it is. We recommend paying them this year. Great. No, I think that makes sense. Um, you know, I've always talked about paying our bills, even, you know, especially, you know, this is slightly different, but when we talk about our, our we always want to have bring in more minority and small businesses and, uh, the single biggest reason why we have trouble doing that is not of our incentive programs. The single big, big, biggest reason I have found, uh, and, and Mr. Price can back me up on this, you know, is that we don't pay our bills on time. Um, and that that's why we don't get smaller businesses, minority businesses, because they can't do that kind of float. So I hate to see us, you know, that's kind of the financially poor decision, you know, poor actions that we do sometimes as a city in the case of the small business, that's not so much to because we're we're out of financially desperate. That's that's more of a, a bureaucratic problem, but it's the same idea. Uh, I want us to make sure we're not being penny wise and pound foolish on our on our funding. So, you know, with that, I, I've got a number of questions for the departments, but I I think that's just the frame, and I appreciate the frame that you're that you're coming out. 
at this with and and uh i want to do the best that we can to to promote that as a as a city to make us undo the bad financial decisions uh and really strengthen up our city for for its programming thank you mr de leon Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you very much for your hard work, uh, CAO's office, Rich, and everybody else. Um, I noticed that the FSR is recommending paying back uh, our credit card, MICLA, uh, that we borrowed to use as working capital. The $150 million in the MICLA projects that were swept during the second FSR, I think, constituted important projects across the city and are critical, obviously, to maintaining the physical uh, infrastructure. Can you elaborate a little on how you plan to prioritize and address the 150 million in nickel funding that was cut? So, Councilmember, first off, we agree with you that those projects actually are critical. Some of them are critical to your districts. They're kind of individual little pieces of gold. Others are just good business. We need to replace our fleet. We need to turn over our cars. They just fall apart. And you can only put them off so long. So we do think they are critical. Um, what we we have sort of a two prong response to that. One is until we get clear guidance on the rent on the revenue relief package. We feel like we shouldn't be spending that money because we actually still may need it. We hope we won't, but we still may need it. And secondly, we have recommended at least we recommend to you and to the mayor that that whole package be folded into the next budget when you see the whole package. I think I'm assuming many of you are members and the mayor's office will last year's list will come first because they were already decided to be priorities before you get to your next wish list whatever that is but i think that will make the most sense in that process when you see how much money you have to spend next year okay uh what am i already um the, let me add also to uh, let me look at you know my notes here because I wrote some notes here looking at the analysis of um, of, uh, of today's file item number twelve here. Um, also, to I think that looking at the numbers, let me get the numbers here. Let me get my notes here. Well, I'm glad to see that the high increase is, is, is being lifted and, and, and we're going back to allowing departments to fill critical positions. I noticed that the cost containment process has not been recommended, recommended for termination. And it's uh, my understanding that the cost containment was done in order to ensure that the city was not getting into contracts that would hurt itself financially. However, I know the cost containment has been applied liberally in many projects that are grant funded have been held up for six months going through this process has there been any analysis of the cost benefit for the cost uh, containment and uh, specifically i know we've delayed the grant funding project for six months i'm assuming the project costs will will go up during that time period costing the city more money so can you give me can you go down uh Give us a little more detail with regards to the cost containment uh and whether or not the contract is, will be approved or denied and if so why so council member thank you you know cost containment never went into cost no um uh it was in a sort of study it twice category more like managed hiring um those contracts are still being approved slowly uh, i it is more slowly because they have to go through another approval process they didn't before. Either they have to be critical for public health and safety, they have to be externally funded, as you point out. Um, so those contracts are being approved, unlike hiring where your council put a flat, while we call it a moratorium, it was just a no. So there wasn't even a chance to petition for consideration. Um, again, until the guidelines for the ARP are clarified, I actually, that was a mayoral directive and your council bought into it. I think it makes sense to keep it there. Um, we're already, as you know, um, well into March. The budget comes out in April. We hope we'll have the guidance by then um, from Washington to make it clear how restricted or unrestricted these funds are. 
Um, and I think that would be the right time to look at whether or not you're going to relax on the hiring and the contracting side. L I'm sorry. L lastly, I'll say that your report states that you're recommending 196 in ARP funds to be put into the reserve fund uh, to equal the revenue shortfalls from uh, last 1920 uh, fiscal year budget. However, this is the first tranche, as we know. Uh, how does the 21-22 budget outlook look compared to the proposed amount of ARP funds we will receive? And do you think the revenue outlooks will be like for 22-23, assuming COVID-19's impacts uh, and this year? Um, I, I say this because on, on the FSR, as we've been trying to build housing as part of the homeless roadmap, I know offices have been running into the situation that there isn't the capital funding. Uh, to build more shelters, uh, non congregate to be clear. Considering that we have these court mandated deliverables as well as a potential global settlement, have we looked as to using some of the ARP funding to address our homelessness crisis? And I, I say this, you know, um, because I have a lot of respect, you know, for budgeteers and budget hawks and deficit hawks. Um, I myself, you know, uh, appointed a, a chair of the Senate Budget Committee and I've served on. The budget committees before uh, and conference budget committee, and I know and I understand, you know, what it means to, to, to have reserves and the quality of our paper with, you know, credit agencies, Standard Poor's, and so be it. You know, Mitch and Fitch or Mitch and Moody's, you know, whatever it may be. Uh, but I'm also concerned too, because obviously we have a, a, a court mandated, um, and uh, he's or her own you know, with regards to I, beauties in the eye of the beholder of what the minimum threshold of reserves are. Uh, my concern is, are we being a little too bullish with regards to socking away money uh, into the reserves and not factoring in the still the magnitude of the humanitarian crisis that we have before us? And should we be utilizing the funds uh, uh, or at least the very least um, taking a real strong look uh, at the crisis still that we have before us. Um, I, I do got concerns about putting all this funding back to the reserve fund. Obviously, as, as, as you know, when we have major expenses coming down the pipeline for a homeless system, and, and that's one of my main, main, main concerns right there. Um, thoughts, commentary. Council member, um you know, I am both the bean counter and I do run the homelessness office and I'm a bleeding heart. Um, I, and we have the lawsuit potential. That puts you somewhere on the spectrum. Of the and the lawsuit potential is both you know. fiscal because we have to be worried about the fiscal implication of the lawsuit yeah. and bleeding heart. Um, the humanitarian crisis is real and we do need to spend, we're going to have to spend to get out of it. That's just a given. I guess I would say a couple of things about that. One, we are looking at least at this point next year that we're going to have to use some of this money just to keep the lights on for next year, based on the controller's recent revenue projections, certainly based compared to our outlook from a couple of years ago, we're still 400 million below where we should be for next year. Um, so money sort of being put in the reserve fund may unfortunately not stay there. Um, secondly, I do think it's very important that we look at the other ARP pots to make sure we use them strategically first to the restricted ones. There is a homelessness and housing pot that we make sure we take full advantage of the restricted pots before you go to your unrestricted funds. Third, your colleagues in Sacramento, sir, are sitting on a lot of money. And but, 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 but using the wisdom of our great budget share, you know, they may be seeing a lot of money, but until it's etched in stone, until no, we see that money is actually think, materialized, it's neither here nor there. It's no, like sir, I think we it. need to be making our plans for next year, yeah. working with Sacramento, and hopefully getting a Sacramento homeless program. Yeah. We don't know how big it's going to be. That, that has to be a Sacramento priority. And then I think you should be using, mainly through the budget, but throughout the year, these new monies to fill all the gaps around that. So I don't think it's, you're never going to spend it. You know, I think you ultimately will probably spend some of it, maybe even much of it. 
but I think you want to spend it wisely once we get the rules on how restricted or unrestricted it is. And once you determine if you're going to get other pots that help fill some of those holes. Well, um, let me ask the question. Do we know when we'll get the rules? Um, I was speaking with several members of Congress earlier today um, to for them to figure out what's fungible, what's not fungible. They themselves, you know, didn't have the answers to my questions, although they voted for the package themselves. I'm not quite sure if they understood everything that was in the package since they were not part of the main negotiating team. But obviously, we need to know what those rules are yes. in, in terms of fun fungibility, you know, and also to we need a, a very clear roadmap as well to, to with regards to the Sacramento question. You know, I know my friends and colleagues who I love them dearly in Sacramento, you know, the federal dollars are passed through, obviously, through Sacramento to land, you know, uh, in, in, in our in our coffers, you know, at, at, the, at the local level. Um, so that is separate, too. Right. And, and in that sense, given the, the magnitude of the, of the humanitarian crisis that's being played out you know, throughout the city, but in particular in CD14. Um, it's neither here nor there on any potential. We hope, we aspire, you know, we want to lobby, we hope they do the right thing. And, and again, going back to Mr. Kokorian's, you know, wise, you know, words, the money doesn't exist until we know that money is, is exists in front of us, you know, so that's neither here nor there, which going back to the original point puts me in a position or I'm a little wary with regards to our own decision making until we see the money. You know, I, I think that uh, so question obviously not so much Sacramento because that's neither here nor there right now. It's more it'd be more speculative. Do we know when we'll get the, the rules with regards to fungibility at the federal level? And two, do um, what is the restrictive uh, line items with regards to homelessness? in this FSR package from the feds? So we are not, we do not know when we'll get further guidance from Treasury. Treasury is doing the state and local pot, but certainly every sort of, certainly national association in Washington and mayors, legislators around the country are pushing them to put out their initial guidance. Um, and this is one of the questions that every, everyone around the country is asking. Exactly. How do you how do you calculate revenue replacement, and how flexible is that pot in particular before you get to other other questions? So we are hoping that you will have that information soon. You know, I cannot promise you. Um, and at this point, we have not received the other. We we don't know what direct allocations we're getting from the other pots, so we are not. All of your sort of city departments are looking, as those ours and the state are looking at those. We are not recommending programming them at this time. We, as soon as we get them, we'll come back to you. Okay. Uh, through the chair, um, I know the other colleagues, you know, have uh, questions or, or commentaries or both. Um, I'll, I'm going to come back. I'm going to look at my notes. A couple of things. I'm going to come back on, on this part right here. Absolutely, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. DeLeon. And and to your point, Mr. DeLeon, too. Um, this is a this is a first, I think, for the Budget and Finance Committee that four of our five members are former members of the state legislature, including a former president pro tem and a former assembly budget chair. Uh, and now more than ever, I think it's really critical that we leverage, you know, that um, background uh, with our friends in Sacramento to ensure particularly as you point out on issues around homelessness and mental health and substance abuse and some of the other things that we need the state's help. And, and I, I agree with you wholly that this should be the time that we strike uh, while they're, you know, while they're working out where they're going to spend their surpluses as well. Without question. Um, uh, Mr. Price, I think was next. I, I Mr. Price. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just want to, uh, uh, express appreciation for the presentation uh, made uh, by CAO and, and staff. Uh, Yeoman's work in, in making sure they and getting us to this point. Uh, you know, we're we know we still have a long way to go, but uh, at least we can see a little glimmer of light. Uh, you know, I think I'm I'm, I'm supporting uh, comments made by uh, Member De Leon. Uh, 
you know, I, I just certainly understand the need to uh, replenish our, our reserve, and, and I want to make sure we do that. Uh, but I, you know, I think we need to be paying ourselves first. And there was some discussion about making sure that small vendors uh, were, you know, got paid, and, and, and those services were able to continue. Uh, you know, the notion of, uh, of providing uh, additional resources to the communities out of this pot, out of some portion of this pot, you know, I think has some, has some appeal. We certainly don't know exactly what that means yet, uh, but uh, the idea of stashing it all away, uh, I think we just need to take a harder look at. Uh, assuming we do that though, uh, Mr. Lowell, let me ask, if we, if we did stash that 196 uh, into the reserve, uh, what would that mean? Uh, would we be uh, back to our our percentage uh, uh, requirement? Uh, we're still short, or what, what does are we have a surplus? What does that mean? One ninety six into the into the fund. So, council member, assuming we get sort of complete flex on these funds and we get to calculate them, though we're talking about, that would actually bring your reserve fund to eleven percent, which is very healthy. We, we would note that is a point in time, and we are expecting, again, that the budget you will want to adopt will require more money than we have. Either it will require some of the next round of ARP and or money out of the reserve fund just to keep the lights on, because we are expecting, again, another bad year next year. Um, but I do believe, speaking to both you and Mr. DeLeon, um, all of your colleagues have needs, the whole city has needs, and you will, I'm certain, want to spend some of this money to address city needs. What we would recommend is we get the guidance and you do that as part of the overall budget process where you're kind of measuring all the needs, which this isn't a time, sometimes you get a grant and it's, you know, September and the budget doesn't have to until April, your budget process is April and May. So we think it makes the most sense when you see next year's gap, you decide how much you're gonna spend of this money to sort of keep the lights on and then where else to put the money. That's gonna give you the cleanest picture of how to spend it. And hopefully we'll have more clarity on the other federal pots of money. And maybe as Mr. DeLeon says, we won't have an answer from Sacramento, but we'll have some sense of where Sacramento's going, particularly on homelessness. Um, so it's it's not don't spend it. It's just don't spend it today. Right. Well, it, it, along that line, is there a need to to uh, um, identify these funds for the um, for the reserve uh, fund now? Do we have to take that action today, for example, or is it something we can still? Well, council member, for? we don't have enough money to pay the bills in June currently unless we take this money in and put it or else we'll have to borrow or use our other reserve funds. So it is, it is our current balance. We're still the 600 million out of whack that we have to find somewhere. We would recommend you use this new money to cover that. So we don't end up borrowing. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Rodriguez. Thank you, Mr. Krikorian. Thank you, Rich. Um, and uh, thank you for also acknowledging that I'm in, uh, I'm the outlier in this conversation and that I haven't been, to, I, I've not been part of Sacramento's. So you hold none of the blame. I, it's not me, <laughs> baby, not me. So um, one day you may go up there. So. Yeah, I'm cool. Any council I'm, member, you're the one that can convince them that they're tired of all the other people you know, and I mean, you're our I, secret weapon. Perhaps, perhaps. And I know uh, Mr. Blumenfeld did uh, introduce a motion as well, uh, trying to help seek additional resources based on the surplus uh, that Sacramento is currently enjoying and boasting about. Uh, so I think clearly, you know, look, what we've seen locally with the uh, relief that they provided uh, just early in the pandemic with Project Roomkey, for example, it was a catalytic change uh, in terms of how we could do this. So. Uh, there will be no long-term solutions to homelessness without Sacramento's involvement and them playing a role. And we should be uh, holding everybody accountable and holding their feet to the fire on that. Um, 
Rich, you know, I know we don't have the the uh, guidelines in terms of the revenue replacement at this time, but there was also the transportation dollars that were announced recently. Is that separate and apart from ARP? It's part of the bigger package. Are the instructions? Because I know, for example, when we talk about uh, the departments and the special funds that experienced revenue loss, the Department of Transportation was among them. So I, I know they're covered under that uh, relief effort. So could you kind of help walk me through this? Are we gonna back them out of this conversation or? So council member, what we are trying to kind of figure out with you and certainly before the budget, as much as we know about all the other pots so that you can know which are the restricted pots and where they're going, obviously with your approval, and then how much unrestricted money you have to do all the things you want to do. Um, and we are, the city will be getting some money from multiple pots. We just, first off, none of that guidance exists yet either. Okay. But, um, but, and this one is on the shortest timeline because Congress has said, you know, they have to actually get this money out the door. But when you say this, when you're talking about ARP. The state and local funding, the Got state it. and local in particular. Mm -hmm. But, so we will be bringing all of that back to you in various forms so you know what the different pots of money are. Um, also, uh, just kind of putting back my old uh, public works hat days, obviously through SIP, we, you know, and some of, you know, just natural attrition, we've had a lot of retirements. On the managed hiring, sometimes that has also caused some impediments for some of the special funded departments to be able to hire with timeliness. Uh, I can think about Bureau of Street Lighting, for example, or some of these other positions. Uh, what is the flexibility amongst those special funded departments uh, to be able to, you know, restore some of the, the staffing uh, gaps that they have as a result of, you know, without having the impediment of managed hiring? So, Council Member, we do still recommend managed hiring. Managed hiring does let uh, the committee approve fully funded positions. Mm -hmm. um, it is important, and your committee knows this, and many of your colleagues don't, not every special funded position is 100% funded. Many of our funds are not paying full freight. That They're still paying something, which is fantastic, but it's not 100% on the dollar. So we think the managed hiring process does give a process to look at the math behind a position. Um, and certainly, we have a quite frankly, a little bit of a backlog right now because there's been the freeze itself. But we are going to be asking departments to, re assuming your council approves that, to resubmit and to prioritize so that we know which ones are the critical ones to for managed hiring to get moving on that. Uh, and, then, and then lastly, I know in the UB we have some, uh, we have some balances in a, a variety of line items and uh, you know, there are substantial uh, balances in some of those items. What is the the reserve for unrealized revenues? What is the plan generally that we have outlined for these funds? Generally speaking, UB monies are either rolled over as part of the budget process, you know, all the X money wasn't spent and your council decides to roll it over, or unspent money at the end of the year is swept. So it's kind of one or the other. Um, and if it's under contract by then, whatever the UB line item is, then it's it's rolled over because it's under contract. It just hasn't all been swept. But if it's not spent at all, it is swept as part of the budget closing process. Are these at this time on these are on the table as part of the conversation to close some of the budget? Gap? I mean, essentially, that's what we're looking at for those resources at this time. Or well, we have recommended in the last report reducing and even closing some UV items. The rest are still there. The hope is I believe they will be spent. If they are not spent though, you know, just technically the budget will sweep them at the end if they're not either spent or rolled over. And in your last report, you approved cutting a lot of stuff in the UV, cutting down the ceremonial days, just cutting a lot of stuff here and there. Council member, this is Jacob Wexler in the CEO's office. Specifically, the UB for unrealized revenue is, is an account that you've built up throughout this fiscal year, uh, which is not backed by revenue. So that's where we've, we've sort of stored away all of the reductions that the council and mayor approved this year. 
in recognition of the fact that revenues are lower. So the thought was that, that that would be swept at the end of the year because there's no cash behind that particular appropriation. So that particular account is a new one that you've built this year specifically for budget balancing. And then there's a couple of other large accounts that are being used to offset the overspending in apartments, like the furlough uh, UB line items, as well as UB reserved uh, for, for uh, mid-year adjustments that are gonna be used to offset the $117 million of overspending this year. So those are also gonna be used for budget balancing. Thank you. All right, let's go back to Mr. De Leon. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, Rich, like I said earlier, I, I have major concerns about putting all the, the, the funding bags to the reserve fund, uh, like you validated when we're gonna have some major expenses coming down the line uh, for homelessness. I was, what are your thoughts about splitting the 249, uh, the 196 that equals the, the, the fiscal year 1920 and the $53 million for reserves for future uses it was earmarked to go back to reserve fund and ask the CAO for a report at the next budget finance committee how the funding could be used to cover the costs associated with the homeless roadmap. I know that that's my understanding, and Mr. Chair, and others would know better, not me. The charter requires two point, I should, I should say 5% uh, minimum for reserves. And I know budget stabilization policy it's 2.75 it's policy policy can always be changed you know i think during robust years we'd like 11 percent but can a a can a can we create a new account for arp funding instead of it all going into the reserves so again council member assuming it's flexible funding yeah. You can obviously do what we the, the reason why I say this is because today's a vote, my understanding, right? Today's a vote where that money goes into the reserve account. Correct. Right? So that money goes uh, swept away into the reserve account and it stays there. You know, we can always pull it out if we have to, but it's, it's a big task to pull it out. You know, and I'm, I'm keenly aware of that, those dynamics as well, too. Um, but as you were saying. So Again, our re our recommendation, sir, is the first tranche of money we do, and I, I hear you saying, I think, that you're supportive of that, is the budget balancing for this year, so not to sweep our reserves and not to borrow. And the question about um, building up our reserves, our recommendation on that is partially, again, because we don't have the advice yet on the spending, and partially because your budget will be before you with the overall package, including next year's tranche of money um, in a matter of weeks for you to decide how much to spend on all of your priorities. Um, so this is only the first tranche. You're going to get another 675 next year. Um, and uh, by charter, the mayor will release his budget no later than April 20th. Um, and your hearings are now already scheduled starting in the beginning of May. So I think we think it makes sense until you see that budget, until you see what the city's sort of general fund whole is, to hold on planning to spend additional fund out of this first tranche. We do think out of the second tranche, you will have more priorities than just budget balance, quite frankly. Okay. I was going to make a motion, you know, uh, today. I'm going to hold off on that motion on the split, splitting the question with regards to the 249 uh, million into the uh, holding off, you know, from the reserves. Um, uh, I just want to just reemphasize with everyone um, that that bill is going to come due very, very soon. And we need the capital because if we have a lawsuit and we have a court mandate and all of a sudden we have no capital to fulfill that mandate, um, I don't want to go to jail, you know, because all of a sudden the way we work with the numbers and be held in contempt of court, you know, because we have a cash flow capital issue while we're trying to figure out fungibility 
roles from the Treasury. It's, it's my hope that the Treasury can sooner rather than later give those rules, you know, uh, 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 to local governments throughout the country, but in particular to the nation's uh, homeless capital, you know, the city of Los Angeles, so we can get access and we can accelerate, you know, um, uh, whatever the agreement is, if there's going to be agreement, if that plane lands with regards to LA Lions lawsuit. Uh, but regards to that, obviously, we have the 6700 that we have to to land at least by December of, of, of this year. So um, I just want to stress again, and I know there's a lot of colleagues who are very similar in terms of, of their thinking uh, uh, that, you know, we have to be creative and I think innovative in, in, in the way we're going to deal again with the magnitude of this crisis, especially for those communities that have been really hit hard, you know, by, by COVID, the Pacoimas of the world, the South LA's of the world and CD9. Ball Heights, you know, the MacArthur Park Pico Unions, you know, in, uh, in, in CD1 and those similar districts. Because when you take CD14, when you take CD14, you take CD9, you take CD13 and CD8, uh, those city council districts contiguous account for 50%. Half of the uh, homeless uh, population in the city of LA, 13, 14, nine, and uh, uh, eight, contiguous. They represent 50% of our unhoused community members. Now, obviously one and two is 14 and, and CD9, you know, we're next door neighbors. And uh, we count for uh, at least more than a quarter, you know, of that percentage in terms of percentage wise, you know. Um, I just want to reemphasize that, you know, obviously, you know, Mr. Chair, uh, this is our first one on FSR, you know, we'll, we'll, when we get into the budget proceedings a little more uh, granular, um, we'll start working this stuff out and, and have healthy, lively, you know, conversations and, 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 and what we do. But as soon as you find out about fungibility from Treasury, would be a great service to all of us, you know, on, on the community and the council as a whole, but especially our or on house committee members. Thank you, Mr. DeLeon. And, and just if, if I, to your point, which is 100% well taken, um, and I think uh, bears repeating that all of the things you described um, are the kinds of challenges that we're still going to face, which is precisely why we shouldn't devote this money now to expenditures on new programs, because by keeping it in the reserve, the money is accessible to us to be able to do that when programs are developed, when the council makes its decision about what to do in the LA Alliance case or investing in new uh, investments related to homelessness and stuff. It's there and available to us to use. And it wouldn't be if we dispersed it through the departments, for example, or if we did other sorts of things like that. So, so in a sense, it's, it's really not that difficult if we have it in reserve to take it out of the reserve once we have a policy that, that we want to adopt with a budget attached to it. Uh, but that's a decision that this committee and, and especially the whole council will, will make. And the money, by keeping it in the reserve, will be accessible for us to do those very things that, that you're talking about. That, that would be my hope anyway that, um, you know, I, I, in other words, I don't think it, it should be our expectation that we can put this money away and keep it forever in reserves and always maintain those reserve levels. As much as Mr. Llewellyn would love that, if we always had an 11% reserve, I just don't think that's realistic to expect that uh, we'll be able to do that given the level of expenditures that we're going to have to be making on the sorts of things you just described. And Mr. Chair, while I would love a healthy reserve fund, I do think homelessness and housing are the humanitarian crisis of our time. And we are going to have to spend some of our own money to it, hopefully matching Washington money, matching Sacramento money, and particularly the sort of downtown core seeing a different place for the residents who are sheltered and the residents who are unsheltered. Yeah. Yeah, no, we're on the same page. And, and, and clearly, yeah. it doesn't make a difference if you're city council, county board supervisor, state legislator, or member of Congress. Uh, those individuals who are tragically currently unhoused their constituents that belong to every 
uh, elected official at every level of government. They're not just exclusive constituents to city government, you know, so hence the, the theme that it's, it's, it's our hope that obviously with the budget, the budget surplus up north in our state capital, that uh, we're able to work with them. Um, but thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Blumenfield, your hand is still up. Did you want to speak yeah. again? Well, it was it, it went up while, while uh, Mr. Dillon was talking, and I think he, you, you basically said it, but I just want to reiterate, our action today is not, is not about stowing away this money into an untouchable area. Um, at least that's not my intention. I mean, I'm, I'm very clear about us trying to avoid doing the, the financially foolish things that I talked about earlier not you know undoing the things that we did out of desperation but it's certainly my intent when we get to the budget process where we put this money in reserve that then we look at our priorities because we have critical needs that we need to spend on and i don't know that we need to have 11 percent in reserve uh at this point in our in in time when we're in the middle of a crisis uh, but that's a decision that we are not making today as i understand it we are you know we're making that decision. We're, we're trying to be smart about it, deal with the um, immediate financial issues, but then, you know, put this into the budget discussion so we can have it talk about the entirety of the budget. Uh, but I just wanted to make it clear that that's not a tension of do we just tuck it all away or do we make expenditures that are critically needed because we're going to have to do both. Yeah. Ms. Rodriguez, your uh, hand is up still. Did you want to speak again? last time okay uh mr de leon anything else all right uh thank you mr llewellyn and mr poon hang on just in case um and members i'd like to now see if there's specific departmental questions uh that you'd like to uh raise with any of the department representatives who are here um Pardon ms me. rodriguez any departments that you want to call special yes uh lapd and a uh, wrap and one sec and fire okay thank you mr price the departmental specials excuse me uh convention center just had a quick question about uh kind of where we are Oh, convention planning, center. Planning our comeback. Convention center, yes. Convention and tourism. Okay. Mr. Blumenfield. Yeah, just uh, the ones that have been mentioned, but to add also GSD and transportation. And Mr. De Leon, any department questions? And not at this moment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. And I'm. I don't have any either. Oh, Ms. Rodriguez. I'm sorry, I had one more. I also had a question regarding grids with the mayor's office was available. I'm, I'm sorry, you broke up just a bit. Can you? Grid uh, with the mayor's office. Did you say grid? Correct. Okay, grid uh, and the mayor's office. Okay, so I have LAPD, Recreation and Parks, Fire, the Convention Center, GSD, and the mayor's office for grid. Anything else? All right. Chair, so if you are not here for one of those departments, uh, thank you very much for your participation in today's meeting. Uh, we appreciate your being here. Um, see you next time. Pardon me, Mr. Chair. Yes, Ms. Morales. Yes, if it's okay with you, may I please read the uh, CLA amendment to the FSR in case there are any questions regarding that as well? Uh, yes, why don't we go ahead and, and do that first before we go to the departments. Thank you. The amendment is to transfer slash appropriate $64,600 in the AB 1290 fund number 53P, account number 281201, CD1 Redevelopment Projects Services, to the Miscellaneous Sources Fund number 45L, into a newly established account number 22T912, entitled Lowry's River Center Project AB 1290 CD1 for a market feasibility study to determine highest and best use for property located at 570 West Avenue 26 for the Lowry's River Center Project. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, all right, so if we could uh, start with LAPD and we'll start with our public safety chair, Ms. Rodriguez. Hey, Dominic, good to see you. Um, <clears throat> just a quick question. What is the projected year-end total over banking liability? Can you guys hear me okay? It, it breaks up a little bit, Ms. Rodriguez, So, but I think if you're looking straight at us, it, it's a little clearer. Okay. Uh, I'm just curious what our um, projected year-end total overtime liability is. Good afternoon, Councilmember Rodriguez. This is Dominic Choi. I, I'm going to actually toss that over to Anne-Marie Sauer for the specific numbers. Thank you, Chief. In terms of the um, overtime that we're going to have banked, we're expecting about $50 million by the end of this year. And basically, it's working out because of the limited cash. About 83% of our overtime is banked. And of that, the majority is going to operations and investigations. Court overtime is minimal right now, but we anticipate next year that that will be back in full swing. And then um, minimal overtime on the non-reimbursable side as well for administ administrative tasks. Now, how does that compare to the previous years? Uh, let's see. So last, oh, council member, I may have to get back with you on that. I don't have last year's banked overtime right in front of me, uh, but we can get back to you with that or we'll try to pull it up in the next few minutes. Thank you so much. Of course. Okay. Uh, members, any other questions for LAPD? Mr. DeLeon, your hands up. Did you want to have anything for LAPD? No. Mr. Price? No. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll send that information to you. Uh, great. Thank you very much. Okay, next up will be uh, Recreation and Parks. And uh, Ms. Rodriguez, why don't you go ahead and start off with Rec and Parks too. Um, I just had a quick question about the programmatic uh, operations that you all had in terms of, I was told in the last time I was asking the questions with respect to uh, programming expenditures that it's protected, that there are no cuts to the Rec and Parks operating budgets with respect to programmatic operations. And so I wanted to get a clear understanding of how many dollars were applied uh, to supplement work provided by Rec and Parks that were, again, you know, we weren't offering any programs and yet I know there were CARES funding that was provided for launching new uh, Rec and Parks re related programming. Um, what is the kind of, what is the differential between uh, how much reserve you have from programs that were not operating and then what was implemented as a result of CARES. I hope I explained that correctly, but hopefully you follow my my line my line of questioning. Do you understand Mr. Gregorian what I'm getting at? Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning or good afternoon. This is Noel Williams, uh, Chief Financial Officer for Recreation and Parks. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I believe I understand your question. I just kind of wanted to Kind of give a little bit of a general overview. Uh, the Rec and Parks sources of funding are, are kind of twofold. One is, of course, our charter mandated money that we receive every year from property taxes. The other portion is a what we call or refer to as self generated revenue, which in the past has uh, been approximately $50 million. With the advent of COVID last year, the department basically, in a sense, um, went out of business. Uh, we also charge fees uh, in addition. So there was a project, well, not a projected, there's been a loss of general fund revenue or cash, if you will, of at least this year of approximately $15 million. Um, so, and also we did not collect fees uh, because we, for a while, we weren't in the business, for example, of golf or uh, aquatics, we have pools that are not open. 
But we also didn't go completely out of business as far as operations were concerned. We, for instance, continued all land maintenance, which includes the maintenance of 400 parks for almost 16,000, 17,000 acres, cleaning, special cleanings, actually, of restrooms, water fountains, uh, green space. Um, and also, money was also spent, a significant amount of dollars were also spent on uh, establishing homeless shelters, 24 homeless shelters, as well as what we will call trailer sites to house the most critical. Um, and in some cases, like last year's summer camp, uh, we, we ran summer camp. However, we only received about $500,000 worth of funding. Um, we continued to run those operations and established alternative learning. So um, at 50 economically disadvantaged um, park sites, as well as uh, 10 fee-based sites. So if you read page 59, we had a loss of revenue, but we continued to operate on other venues. Um, and so there has been a shortage in our salaries general account. Um, also, uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, one, we lost revenue, but as we discussed earlier in today's meeting, we also are absorbing uh, our budget was uh, uh, reduced during the budget process to account for um, 26 furlough days, of which we only had 20, uh, which we've only had four, and also we are also making SIP payments. So a significant amount of funding has gone towards that. Um, I'm not sure if that answered your question or not. Yeah, I'm well, but I'm just to get to the to the core of it, you said there was a net loss of 15 million in that revenue? Yes. So, I mean, um, if you will, I just to give a kind of like on a personal basis, let's assume that, you know, we all have a budget and we're all ready to pay bills. But if your direct deposit don't go, doesn't go in, then you don't have the cash to do that. And some many of the people that maybe were working on recreational programming, actually we repurposed if you will, to work on homeless sites and homeless trailers or homeless shelters and homeless sites. Um, we had many people working on uh, helping as uh, service workers to deliver meals to people. We had people do contract tracing. So um, it wasn't that we completely went out of business. We just didn't do normal business, but we did not have the revenue to shore up uh, full-time expenditures, if you will. And so when you were repurposing some of the staff and just and just to be clear on the charter mandated uh, uh, revenue that's protected for rec and parks is that delineated in terms of what that use could or should be or is that uh, so like for example is it for maintenance and operations is it for youth programs is it does it is it delineated explicitly on what the appropriate uses are uh, actually, uh, we put in a budget proposal. There are several programs within uh, recreation and parks, um, which you know uh, you will, when you uh, uh, refer to the budget proposal, we have our programs broken out by um, museums and education, observatory, aquatics, building facilities, land maintenance, um, recreation, and uh, public safety as well as uh, some other city services. And you as a council and with the approval of the mayor approve the expenditures of those funds as part of the budget process. I mean, just to be clear, then it doesn't, the, the charter mandate doesn't outline explicitly what those uses can be. It's just generally speaking, it's a number. Is that accurate? I'm sorry, I, you broke up just a little bit. Could you repeat your question? So just to be clear, I'm trying to determine and I'm trying to learn, um, is, is the charter mandate protective of what those uses are? Does it explicitly lay out what those uses are? And it doesn't explicitly, for instance, say that 2% will go to aquatics. No. Um, it's actually the charter um I hope I'm going to say this correctly, puts the funds for the department under the control of the Department of Recreation Park Commissioners. 
and then you do approve it as part of the council and the mayor and budget process. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, okay. I hope Thank you. Helpful. Hey. Yeah, it's very helpful. Hope, and I'm hoping you can hear me better now. Am I mic better? Yeah, I, I, think you I might have fixed pretty well right now. Yeah. Okay. I think I fixed what was wrong. All right. Thank you so much. That's Thank much you. better. Um, okay. Uh, members, anything else for Rec and Parks? Mr. Blumenfield. You're muted, Mr. Blumenfield. Oh, just, just a quick follow up on, on Councilwoman Rodriguez's question about the uh, Rec and Park funding. With, with, with all of the when you stood up all the homeless uh, emergency shelters, that that's all FEMA reimbursable, right? Uh, what is FEMA reimbursable is uh, overtime and materials. Um, we did receive some CARES funding, but we did ex use our own budgetary accounts uh, to support many of those activities. So there, there is um, actual FEMA reimbursement uh, which you would, uh, which the CAO's office uh, is coordinating, and, and I will have to refer to their expertise, uh, which we could get uh, back overtime and materials. Um, and then we also, separate from strict FEMA reimbursement, there was CARES money, uh, which we received some money, um, well, some money through the CARES Act. But again, we probably, we did, ex I know in fact that we did expend more than we received back in reimbursement. And of that, some of that, much of that money came out of our budgetary accounts, which was our charter mandated money. But like all the other departments, that money, when we get the reimbursement money, that basically goes back into the general fund. That's not, just to be clear, it doesn't go back in, there's no special rec and parks fund or the, the mandated uh, funds that you get. If you use those funds, it doesn't have to then be reimbursed back into those funds. Is that correct? Uh, yes and no. I would think that uh, I will have to ask uh, Mr. Llewellyn. I would think if there were some ability or some way some funds may come back. But remember, we some of the money was borrowed from different sources, and I believe that fee and given to us. And I believe that money will have to be reimbursed to those sources first. Would that be correct, Mr. Llewellyn? So, Council Member, we will be ultimately with FEMA having to do a general fund special fund um, accounting as well. So that to the extent that a sanitation fund, some kind of special fund front funded a theme activity, we will be sort of reimbursing money to the special fund. Um, in the case of Rec and Parks, where it wasn't a special fund. That's a different thing. It, it, but it's a mandated percentage fund. I mean, they, they, there was a certain amount of money we have to spend on Rec and Parks per the charter. Um, and if we spend some of that money on things that are FEMA reimbursable, I guess because there's enough money in rec and parks, I, it doesn't get more complicated where that money then has to flow back through rec and parks or does it go through the regular reimbursement process? You know, part of that sort of depends on with those kind of special departments, which is particularly library and, and rec and parks. Um, and while the zoo is not like that, you have traditionally paid some general fund and some it's been sort of an enterprise fund that to the extent that it has general fund, it's obviously under your control. To the extent it's sort of their, their kind of legal minimum, it's sort of that part you do in fact leave in that department. So traditionally you have given the Rec and Parks Department general fund on top of its legal minimum. And that part is obviously regulated differently. All right, so I guess part of the answer is we'll, we've yet to, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir, it is. Okay. Thank you. All right. Anything else for Rec and Parks members? Okay. Thank you all very much. Uh, let's go next to the convention center and Mr. Price. Thank you. And I think I saw Mr. Liu a moment ago. So here? There he is. There. Very good. Great. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, uh, as our economy makes a comeback, certainly tourism, hospitality, I think, are going to be uh, real drivers in, in, in what happens. And so just curious, Dome, uh, at the convention center, what plans are we making? What programs are afoot? How are we um, going to be ramping up uh, activities uh, at the convention center based on uh, contracts you have so far? Yeah, thank you, uh, Councilman. 
<clears throat> for the opportunity to uh, discuss the Convention Center, which is uh, one of the uh, responsibilities of our department, Convention and Tourism Development. Um, at the Convention Center, um, I like to say we are your best economic development recovery plan that the city has because there is really no work to be done. We have signed contracts for every day of for the convention center for the next five years plus. Um, it's not like we have to go out and market the convention center to get business. If the state and the county were allowed, were our were to allow conventions tomorrow, we could have a convention tomorrow. I mean, there, there's no marketing that has to be done. Um, as of now, um, our clients have canceled uh, through the summer, I would say, although we still have a citywide convention that's holding out hope to be able to have their event in June. We have the LA Art Show, which is not a citywide event, but what we call a local or consumer event. They are advertising today um, and selling tickets for their event in July. Um, we have upcoming this year um, the second largest consumer electronics event you know, next to CES, a, a worldwide event called uh, Mobile World Congress. Um, they are planning uh, their show for October. Um, they are originally in Barcelona. They'll have their Barcelona event in June. They just had their Shanghai event. They had 20,000 attendees in February, so they are planning on coming here in October. And um, and then the big one um, that uh, uh, is really, you know, probably going to be the test, uh, not only of the convention center and its cap capabilities, but also a test of consumer uh, demand. But the LA uh, LA Auto Show is planning on coming uh, back at the end of November through December. So we are, to answer your question, Councilman, um, we are preparing to welcome back conventions as soon as the state and the county allow us to do so. There is a coalition of all the convention centers in California that have been meeting with the governor's office, Dee Dee Myers and GoBiz, um, trying to put together the um, the uh, guidances for allowing conventions. Um, we're even hoping to that there's some consideration about digital health passes and things like that that will give uh, not only attendees the confidence, but you know exhibitors and um, show show uh, planners uh, the confidence that uh, uh, their attendees will be safe when they at attend a, a convention. Good. All right, we'll continue planning. That's that's good news. We're ready to go. All right. Thank you. Thank I you, Mr. Chairman. My pleasure. Members, anything else for Mr. Liu? All right. Uh, thank you very much. Let's go next to uh, Mr. Blumenfield and General Services. Great. Thank you. Um, now, this, this is sort of based on the, the, the question. It's I'm going to ask the number of the parks, but the deferred MICLA projects, um, you know, in the second FSR, we deferred a lot of MICLA projects because we would need borrowing capacity for operating expenses. And this one, because of these funds, we don't need MICLA borrowing capacity anymore. Um, but it seems like the only item that we're restoring is at the moment on MICLA is LAFD stuff. So overall, my interest is why, why aren't we restoring items, other items for authorization when I look at different things, I'm talking about traffic signals for safety and GSD fleet replacement. You know, we have about 58 million in various years authorizations, vehicles for BSL, Streets LA, other departments. Um, so specifically for GSD, I wanted to ask, you know, what equipment were you planning to buy with the 58 million in MICLA authorizations for what departments? And what is the cost of not replacing equipment in terms of repair costs downtime from broken vehicle equipment, et cetera. Uh, and this is more about trying to make sure that we make decisions that are financially smart for the city. And we don't, you know, we don't just hold on to the decisions that we made out of desperation because we've already made them. Uh, so 
and it's, I'm going to have a similar line of questions for for DOT as well, but with GSD. So that's that's the question. Well, good afternoon. Uh, this is Richard Colson, Assistant General Manager for GSD. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Oh, perfect. Yeah, so as far as the type of equipment, again, uh, there's uh, various types of equipment, anywhere from light and medium duty trucks to off-road construction equipment, trailers, aerial lift equipment for city employees, and uh, again, a vast array of uh, departments, anywhere from rec and parks to street services, Department of Transportation, um, just to name a few. It was a huge list. And as far as, as cost, uh, again, I can get pretty detailed, but I will tell you, uh, I think, as we had mentioned before, with some prior uh, budget times, uh, again, like 50% of our fleet is overused for life. So this, uh, when we lost these MICWA funds, it only took us down even further. Uh, and just to give you an example, like our light and medium duty trucks, uh, we have a useful life for those pieces of equipment. And ideally, we want to get rid of it and salvage it before any huge uh, work is needed. But what's happening now is we're in the midst of that huge work. So. Uh, we were just running reports and finding that on average engine work could could vary uh you know between 13 to sixteen thousand dollars per truck uh you know as we're, we're having to put it in the shop whether we do it ourselves or contract it out just to put in engines and things that we should have uh we should have retired actually uh so it's those types of costs that we're seeing and that does greatly affect uh availability for customers uh you know the, the actual downtime of equipment obviously if it just comes in for a service I have it for you know a few days, just depending. Uh, if it needs any major work, it could be down for weeks. Uh, you know, thus the customers don't have the equipment they need to do their services. So, that's just an example. Is there a list of the? I mean, obviously there's there's the ideal life point. You know, when you when you mapped it out of when these trucks need to to be refreshed and we need to get new ones, uh, and then presumably every year that's over that ideal point starts costing us more in maintenance uh, and long-term hurts our, our financial ability to, to do the work. Uh, and it sounds like we're pretty far past that ideal point on a lot of these products, on a lot of the, these purchases. So it sounds like you have an idea, but I guess, I, I guess at the end of the day, I'd love to see, you know, especially as we move, work toward the budget, a report uh, to prioritize what what of the you know for what needs to be reauthorized in terms of the Mikla funded equipment purchases that have been canceled, uh, and maybe maybe you all could help put that together. Okay, I, I just as just as an example too, I know in the last number of FSRs we've always asked for uh, additional funding for our parts account, which uh, typically goes has gone in deficit the last you know, three or four years, uh, you know since the last downturn actually. Uh, just as an example, but we could certainly put a, a list together for you. Yeah, I guess I guess I'd like to see more than a list. I'd like to see sort of a cost benefit. You know, that it's one thing to give us a list of of things that are over past their lifetime, uh, and that's useful. But as we have to make these tough financial decisions, understanding where the where where the, what the cost benefit is of these. Uh, deferrals and of, of us going in and putting the money in to prevent the deferral of the, the maintenance. So is there a way that uh, when you do, and, and I can do it as a formal request, Mr. Chair, but to, to, to get a report back and, and, and maybe by the end of this, I'll, I'll make that a formal request, but you know, is there a way that you can do it in a more quantitative way so that we know exactly what is costing us, you know, what are the most desperately needed, uh, equipment purchases that that Mikla had been used for and how much they're costing us? Uh, yes, we could we could uh, put a list together. Yes. OK, I guess all right, Mr. Chair, I, I'm going to ask for as part of this, if we can get a report back maybe within 30 days so that we can have it for uh, budget time uh, on the prioritization for reauthorization of canceled Mikla funded equipment purchases. Um, with including a, uh, some sort of cost benefit breakdown on on each of those purchase, uh, deferred purchases. Very good. Thank you. Members, anything else for GSD? Uh, Council Member Blumenfeld, this is Megan with the CAO's office. If I may just add, um, I'm the GSD liaison. 
Uh, with respect to FIRE's MICLA appropriations, FIRE's fleet replacement was not deferred in the second FSR. So um, I, I just want to make sure that you're aware that there's a consistent policy that's been applied with fleet replacement, whereas FIRE, FIRE's wasn't um, deferred in the second FSR and GSB was. We're going to have, as uh, uh, Mr. Llewellyn alluded to, we're going to have a conversation about restoring those deferrals, I think, when the R money starts rolling in. You're right. No, I, thank you. And I, I understood that. And, and that made sense that, uh, but I guess in anticipation of that, that conversation that we're going to have, having a, a, a list that has, that's linked to the cost benefit would help us uh, have a more informed conversation. We agree. Thank you. All right, thank you. If there's nothing else for GSD members, let's go next to LAFD. And I'll ask Ms. Rodriguez to start us off with FIRE again. Thank you very much. Um, so just a quick question regarding the status of the uh, early intervention treatment program and the telemedicine. I don't know who's here from FIRE. Um, Good afternoon, council members. This is Emilio Rodriguez with the uh, Fire, Fire Department's Administrative Services Bureau. Hi, so just what is the status of the programs and what uh, what specific funds will be, uh, are gonna be used for these programs? Uh, both of these programs are drawing funds that were uh, previously awarded under the uh, Innovation Fund. Um, so these are reappropriation of a uh, carryover funds from last year. The early intervention program is well underway. Uh, the department has hired a, an athletic a trainer to assist um, our members with, uh, you know, who are experiencing the injury issue, injury issues or potential injuries as a result of a uh, Field work. So the idea behind that program is to uh, minimize the risk of injury before it escalates into, you know, workers' comp issue, uh, for instance. Um, so the con the funding that's being carried over is to continue supporting the contract with uh, Sean Higgs, the athletic trainer, as well as the salary for the. Uh, you know, sworn staffing for that program, which is a Captain Hammond and uh, some, uh, you know, some expense costs as well. Uh, so that will carry the program through the entirety of this fiscal year. The second program is for the uh, telemedicine. It was originally authorized to support uh, an APRU at the, uh, multi at the um, MFC facility, the uh, Metro Fire Communications Facility, but the program, the funds are currently supporting uh, telemedicine uh, physicians to continue supporting uh, COVID response for one thing. And uh, again, uh, that program is active. It's underway through as needed uh, physicians and um, the real preparation will basically backfill some of those salaries as well. So is it anticipated that going forward then, so you said this will basically cover us for this fiscal year, correct? Right. So then in the new fiscal year, we anticipate that these would be new expenditures that would be uh, requested for appropriation to continue? Uh, essentially, yes, absent the availability of uh, non-general funding sources. And, and at this time, I mean, that they're kind of falling within that budget? of what had been appropriated previously? Yes, they're expanding within budgeted parameters. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Members, anything else for FIRE? Okay. Let's go next to DOT and back to Mr. Blumenfield. Thank you. And uh, hello, Ms. Barrett Reynolds. Uh, my questions are, are similar to what I was talking to uh, GSD about in terms of the deferrals. I wanted to get a sense from you. How, how many traffic signals are being deferred due to the deauthorization of the MICLA authority? Thank you for the question, Councilmember. I appreciate it. 
uh, you know, when the MICLA funds got swept, we had three different primary impacts. One was um, the purchase of transit vehicles. Another was traffic signals. And the last one was our mobile command center that we use um, for emergency response. So whenever you see, you know, LA Fire, LAPD uh, responding to an emergency D on a 24-7 basis, DOT is almost always there as well. Um, so we were able to use some Prop A dollars to keep our transit uh, vehicle purchases moving forward. Um, but the other two uh, categories we were, we have not been able to uh, restore or replace that funding. So for the traffic signals, uh, we tried to do everything we could to keep that program going by continuing to design the signals um, that we have in queue. So we have a citywide backlog of 358 traffic signals. Um, and we have about 44 of them uh, that are currently where design is complete or that where they are, are uh, in design. And that includes um, coordinating with our colleagues at Streets LA uh, and BOE to design the um, ADA ramps that will accompany all those signals as well. So it's a multi-departmental effort. Um, so the, the answer to your question is, um, there's certainly, we certainly could have released some of those signals out to bid if we had had the MICLA funding. Um, if we do not have it restored next fiscal year, we will have about a package of about 45 signals um, that won't be able to go out to bid. So that's the, the sort of the, the long and short of it. Uh, the mobile command center, you know, we're very grateful to um, all of the talents of the, the firefighters of the city of Los Angeles um, during the last fire. Uh, we actually had a firefighter out there working to repair the old vehicle that we have, um, but we are uh, concerned about whether or not uh, it'll be able to, to um, continue to su support the department in the next round um, of those kinds of, of annual emergencies that we all respond to now as a city. Um, in the form of, of fires and other sort of large scale events that may require evacuations. So I think that, I hope that answers your question. We can, to your, your question you raised, I know to, to GSD, I was listening to that conversation. We'd be happy to give you a sense of um, what uh, that not replacing those signals or not, not constructing those signals costs the city. Um, because we, we know how many uh, crashes had occurred and we know how many crashes have occurred since those signals have been under design and we have uh, uh, cost estimates for each of those crashes. Um, so we, we can get that information to you as you deliberate um, during your next round of discussions about uh, the restoration of some of those funds. And your, your cost estimates are basically just the amount that we're paying out in lawsuits, right? Well, there's two, there are the amount, there's settlements that we pay out in lawsuits, but I wasn't even really referring to that. Um, actually, the, uh, we have in transportation um, cost estimates for what each crash costs, um, and that those costs are uh, compiled on a federal level, and they're, they cover things like damage to vehicles, um, Medicare and Medicaid costs that accompany any kind of um, severe uh, injuries that may occur as a result of the, those crashes. Um, so even not even getting into the settlement costs, um, which I know we, we Mr. Kerkorian and, and uh, all of you could get into as well in great detail, um, we actually know what does it cost to the city um, when we don't have those safety measures in place, just in terms of crashes that may or may not ever uh, materialize into lawsuits. Yeah, and obviously the, there's, the human cost, you can't, I mean, you, you, you're attempting to put some, some sort of uh, uh, quantification of it, but, but that's also intangible, you know, <laughs> intangible, right. exactly. So great. Thank you for that. And appreciate you uh, working on that as well. The report back. Thank you. Thank you, members. Anything else from Ms. Reynolds? All right. Uh, thank you very much. And then to close us out. Ms. Rodriguez, uh, we'll go to you, and I'd like to invite up the mayor's office to discuss grid, please. Thank you so much, Mr. Gregorian. Um, <clears throat> and uh, you know, the the quick question I had was based on uh, the remaining unspent funds from grid service providers uh, that remains available. Uh, I know it's two hundred and fifteen thousand, but there was. 
uh, the recent proposal that allocates uh, several million dollars for many of these same service providers that are listed uh, here that haven't concluded their work uh, or expended all of the resources. And so I'm just curious how, uh, what the con uh, contract obligations are gonna look like for these same service providers uh, going forward, given that uh, these reinvestment dollars were just allocated. Council Member, this is Reginald Zachary, the interim director of GRID. And I just wanted to share to you that um, this surge program was prepared before the reimagining um, money um, was allocated to GRID. And so this program was designed to um, enhance the work that GRID had already established in the communities where we had an uptick in violence. And so um, we have been providing additional funding to um, increase our numbers of our intervention workers to directly address the issues in South Los Angeles and East LA when we had the uptick in violence in December and January. So these unspent funds you're saying are already spent? G Gabby. Uh, hello, my name is Gabriella Hasso. I'm the Director of Grants and Finance um, and I can answer your question about GRID. So these uh, contracts um, that were unencumbering um, to fund the surge uh, agreements, those contracts have closed. And what we were able to do was sweep the money of the unused funds from 1920 in order to fund the 2021 surge contracts, if that makes sense. Okay, so, and, and so in terms of the service provide, the, the contractual obligations of these same service providers, all of those resources based on the reimagined money is going to be encumbered and spent in this fiscal year or is it going because i mean the the dollars that we appropriated were for this fiscal year so i'm just trying to understand what what that looks like in the street and what's the sustainability uh going forward given that you you know uh given what i'm i don't know what i'm yeah. looking at so I'm, I'm just trying to better understand how how that's going to, what yeah. that's going to look like both on the street yeah. level and in the budget. It will enhance the programs that we already have in place. Um, and the money will carry over into our next fiscal year. Um, we have not received all of those funds yet. So we're, we are um, right now operating on the funds that we have now. And in order to continue our program till June 30th, we needed to take care of um, our six agencies that are listed there. And so the contractual obligations are, are going to be uh, of the additional resources that have been uh, granted or authorized as part of the reinvestment. Uh, it's going to continue in line with what their contractual obligations were previously, or are they going to be different? They're going to be is, is, is what they were already obligated to do. And then we're going to be enhancing those services with the additional funds that we've received. Okay. And then and desires to expand the program. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Ever see anything else for grid? All right. Thank you all very much. Um, unless there's any other questions or comments, members, that I think concludes our discussion of the FSR. Uh, Mr. Blumenfield, um, have you have you uh, completed making your uh, requests for additional reports. Yeah, just that addition, just that one to ask for a report back. Um, Thirty days prioritization of the reauthorization of canceled MICLA funded equipment purchases, both to GSD and and uh, and to DOT. Okay, great. And I would also like to include uh, a request that the CAO report with the assistance of the Bureau of Sanitation on the costs and staffing required to restore the care and care plus programs to a deployment that allows adequate hygiene and sanitary services to be provided around homeless encampments uh, during this fiscal year as well. Um, is there any other um, comments, suggestions, uh, Questions about the FSR members. Okay, then um, with those amendments, were there any other amendments from the CAO's office, the CLA uh, amendment was read in 
Was there anything else needed to be amended on the part of the CAO? No, we're good. Okay. All right. Well, then with those amendments, um, let's go ahead and please call the roll. Krikorian. Aye. Blumenfield. Blumenfield, aye. De Leon. Aye. Rodriguez. Aye. Price. Aye. Five ayes. This item is approved as amended, as stated. Phew. That was the long one. Uh, very good. So we have completed the consent items. We've completed item 14. Um, completed item 12. Uh, I believe that completes our open session agenda items. Am I correct? Correct. Very good. Uh, then with that, we will proceed next into closed session. And uh, Ms. Morales, please let me know when you've completed what you need to do for that. Thank you. Just one moment. There being no other business before the committee, I want to thank the members and staff for your patience in staying so late. Uh, if there's no other business before us, we are adjourned. Thank you all very much. Fuck.